Hey, welcome to Scotland Conversations, where we're having conversations with some of the amazing guests and speakers here at Kotlin Conf 2024. I'm Quinn Twit Dow, and I'm speaking with Ross Tate. Ross, thanks so much for joining me. I, I, I'm, I caught Ross before his talk, so he is very generously sacrificing practice time to talk to us today. Uh, so thanks so much, Ross. Thanks for having me. So uh, what do you do and what's your history, your backstory with Kotlin? Uh, so I do research and consulting on programming language design and implementation. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be making the language and figuring out how to make the type system in particular, all the way back to how to implement it well and efficiently on various systems. Mm -hmm. um, with Kotlin specifically, I have sort of two different roles. So way back in 2012, I started working with Andre on Kotlin. Mm -hmm. um, he mostly just asked me to, based on some of the research I'm doing, just to like listen in on conversations, throw in ideas once in a while, or yeah. find out, oh, hey, there's a, like, a thing you should know here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, eventually, we worked on making the what type projections and mixed side variants and the uh, nullability, well, uh, platform types yeah. Um, yeah. for interrapping with Java. And then I went into sort of professorship land, you know, I had mm -hmm. students, all that stuff. And now I've sort of gone back to independence and sort of doing now somewhere between industry and research mm -hmm. with uh, consulting work. Uh, and I'm working with the Kotlin team on sort of making the next iteration of the type system. And just to make sure I don't scare people, we're planning on keeping everything backwards compatible, mm -hmm. uh, at least backwards compatible in practice. If you can <laughs> see my talk, I'll explain what that means. Yeah. Um, uh, and then once we've made the changes that give us a better foundation, we, that gives us a lot of room to add features that people have been asking for. I have to say, like when I one of the first Kotlin talks I gave was actually trying to for my soft grok and actually explain platform types. So to like be meeting the person and, and speaking with the person that helped kind of like kind of come up with that concept for that bridge between Java and Kotlin is really cool. So thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, and I think that that I think that even that particular like aspect of the language is such an interesting story in kind of like the adoption of Kotlin and kind of the evolution of as a JVM language and, and how to bridge those gaps. And in general, it just feels like such an interesting problem uh, to solve. And I, I think, uh, especially with Kotlin, uh, it's kind of my first idea or my first experience with a modern language. Uh, but you seem to have experience with a lot of different languages. How did you, I guess, how did you kind of center in on programming languages and programming language design as like, you know, a specialty and as a career? That's an interesting question. So. Uh... Wasn't wasn't an original plan when I started college or anything like yeah. that. I actually started off as a math major, mm -hmm. and then it's like, hey, like these things that people are making seem fun. So I added computer science, um, and I still have a lot of mathematics like background uh, to keep that up. Uh, but definitely, computer science and programming languages in particular became my focus. Uh, I remember when I started grad school, I hadn't decided whether I do programming languages or not. Um, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I want to do graphics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, I actually used to develop video games. Um, and uh, my the person, person that recruited me into grad school was like, oh, I have a cool project for you, and sort of gave me something in programming languages that got me started. And then I was like, this is fun, and I kept going with it. Mm -hmm. uh Awesome. What, what uh, did, are you a big gamer? Is that why video? You did you make games because you were like an avid gamer? Or? Uh, I don't know if avid. I mean, I enjoy them. You enjoy uh, them. Okay. Like I, now, like nowadays, uh, you know, play play the video games with my my kids and things like that. Okay. Um, uh, and back then, I enjoyed them. Uh, so, like, uh, what do they work on? Um, I worked on some of the Spider-Man games way back when. Really? Um, okay. I, but like, yeah. As 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 an intern, I never because I got pulled into grad school instead, so I never ended up actually staying with it. But I still have some friends in the game, in the game community. I, I think it's interesting. Like a lot of people, I don't know that. I, I I guess a lot of my particular software development friends, we all kind of got into development, like engineer software engineering, because of games. But then we most of us are like, mm, maybe not gaming, maybe not making games. Maybe I just want to play them. <laughs> so I just think that's a cool thread. Um, and I think it's so interesting because as you said, you had a math background and um, not to scare anyone off, but I, I know like, especially in your talk, you have to touch on certain things like, like kind of very formal, like properties or very like kind of academic like aspects of program language design. But I think one of the things that is so interesting to me about Kotlin is that while I'm really aware of kind of like the design and intention behind the design of the language, you know, as a, and I'm, I just feel like I'm an average everyday engineer that just uses it. And that, that, that maybe I was wondering about the tension between 
you know, kind of the academic formal rigor or formal properties of something and wanting to make it kind of like, I don't know, theoretically like a good language. But then how do you take that and then take kind of like the stuff that we all complain about on an everyday basis or the things that we want as just like, you know, uh, everyday users? And how, how do you, when you're designing a language, how do you keep that kind of like formal, maybe like uh, mathematical rigor and still kind of incorporate the things that everyday people want uh, and, and keep, keep keep the two in balance? Like. Sure. So uh, when I'm like working with team on, on design, mm -hmm. uh, generally the things I will ask them first are like, what are the key kinds of uh, meta properties that you want to have? Mm -hmm. Like, so uh, do you want memory safety or is that something that the programmer is responsible for? Um, that's like, that's their design decision. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that gives me sort of, okay, here's the, the, the space I need to work in within now, and I'm going to help them stay within that space. Uh, and then we'll go through, okay, uh, how do you want people to achieve that? What kind of experiences do you want people to have? Uh, and largely go through use cases. Um, and uh, so like in the talk today, I'll sort of talk about um, uh, union types. Uh, they've been a requested feature a lot. Uh, and I'll illustrate why union types uh, in general can be really bad for uh, if you want an efficient type checker. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at why people want union types, you can analyze those specific cases and say, okay, well, there's some more structure here than just arbitrary union types. And that structure can be exploited in a way that we can make it so we can handle them efficiently. Uh, so you can get something that's both theoretically nice and pragmatically nice. And the, in some ways, they're intention because any theoretical feature you want to add can really blow up the system. Right. In other ways, they get along because the pragmatic things can really guide the theory into how to make something in particular solvable, decidable, um, efficiently. Mm -hmm. Is there like is there at some point where you kind of have to decide that in terms of like, like I think it's interesting like I you know like I and I really appreciate about Kotlin and kind of a lot of the talks that I've heard over the years from like Roman and Andre about kind of like the design of the language is that there's a very like measured hand in like trying to keep it like as you said like kind of reduce like complexity uh but also really trying to make a language that people enjoy and that allows them to write the code that they want to write I, i've heard that so many times and i really enjoy that it, is it is there like a conscious decision or almost like a demarcation like okay for so at this point what our goal like to meet our goals we like like how much of it becomes like okay how much can we do and how much can we provide as a language and how much of it is left as an exercise to the developer like i guess in terms of like correctness like i know a lot of what you're talking about today is kind of like the uh sorry the not under that that the type system is undecidable uh which i had to look up a little bit i'll be honest it's been a while since <laughs> comsci um you know, and, and and the kind of the problems that arise from that. So the, the errors and bugs that can arise from that, like in any kind of like in general, like, you know, I, I, I don't know what the right term would be like, uh, not weakness, but like kind of maybe tricky point or sticky point in the language. Um, is there like a conscious decision to be like, okay, we need to let engineers or users of the language kind of have good code hygiene or good, you know, development hygiene uh, versus, okay, we can take care of that. Like, how does that conversation, or maybe is there a decision there where you kind of balance that? Uh, so without going inside of blue specifically, uh, in general, like, it's a lot, uh, I don't know, like, like, it's a lot up to the the team. So I, mm -hmm. I try to, when I work with teams, like, Make sure that okay, these are the trade-offs that you are considering because mm -hmm. that's basically what you're saying. There's yeah, trade-offs. Trade yeah, trade-offs. Yeah. Um, these are the trade-offs you're considering. Uh, here are some techniques that maybe you'd like to know about for achieving those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Here are some downsides that might not be available to that or that may not be uh, obvious to you at first hand, mm -hmm. uh, and so that they can make a formed a more informed decision of those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. But it's largely like kind of their call and then a lot of people like Kotlin because of the calls that they've made mm -hmm. in that space. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so like, I guess an example with um, platform types is we had to decide, okay, what are we gonna do uh, with generics? How deep are we gonna go into the type problem? Right, right. Um, we ended up doing a very shallow problem for both pragmatic, or, or, uh, for a couple of reasons. One was, uh, well, the JVM is already raw and only supports up to a certain depth. So there's right. only certain guarantees we can get anyways from the run types from the limitations of the runtime system mm -hmm. uh and then you know if you go further it ends up being sort of 
kind of getting to this point where programmers feel bogged down by the type system rather right. than lifted up by the type system. Yeah. And you kind of get that feel by trying out programs yourself, making sure that you're writing programs that are not just the ones that like sort of max out the capabilities of the type system, like collection libraries tend to always be the ones that push, here's the things I need to add, whereas there's lots of things that people are writing that are sort of string manipulation and data structure manipulation, mm -hmm. and they don't need all that complexity. So if they're getting bogged down by complexity, then that means you've leaked your problems into someone else's problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thank you for, <laughs> I, I appreciate the thought behind that. Um, I was kind of curious, like you've worked on a lot of, it sounds like you've consulted and you have worked on a lot of languages. I want to ask like a question, it's a little bit odd, I'm not sure how to ask this, but what what are the main reasons you see about why people create a new language? I thought that was fascinating because, you know, like I think as me as like a programmer, I just kind of like know that these things exist and that people that do X product use this language and that very, I mean, it feels like not too often do new languages arise, at least from my perspective, just in my kind of everyday life. And I was kind of curious, like, what makes someone decide to write a whole new language? Is it always necessity? Is it kind of like, I don't know, some like altruistic desire to make things better? Like what, what, what is like, what are like the, the, the main trends you see behind people want, like the motivations? Uh, well, so a lot of people, I mean, in my field, as I yeah. come from programming languages uh, background, uh, a lot of people do it just because it's fun. Okay, um, no, that's totally fair. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, like doing, taking these things and saying, okay, like how, like here's a here's I want to be able to write this kind of code, and I want to be able to write it well, um, or so some way that I'm happy with, mm -hmm. and figuring out, okay, well, actually, well, it turns out there's this constraint I never anticipated. There's this constraint I never anticipated. Can I find some new path? through this space, or maybe it's even some existing path that I'm happy with, and say, okay, that solves my problem well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, it's uh, you kind of get similar things when you're making programs rather than programming languages where you have to come up with an architecture, right? right. And say, okay, what kind of architecture is gonna fit this space? They're all gonna have trade-offs, uh, and solving those trade-offs is just sort of a fun challenge for many people. No, I, I think we all kind of want to create a new thing rather than always necessarily improving or just utilizing something else so that kind of makes sense um so then like the if you want to get beyond just making it for fun yeah then then there's generally you have some sort of necessity either something that drives you something that you see driving like a hole in the industry mm -hmm. um uh but and having that can be really useful because if you're doing something just for fun then you can uh go off the deep end and that can be great for you but yeah. if you if you're like no my goal is to make an actual product that people are going to use mm -hmm. really understanding what the things that are driving you to make that product yeah uh including the things that aren't just fun but are really pragmatic helps become part of that design constraint and that design space and if you embrace that then you get a really nice language property if you get like oh i just like that's just getting in the way of my fun. Then you get something that's fun for you, but it's not gonna be work for everybody. But occasionally some people just sort of say, no, I'm just gonna do what's fun for me. And if it's fun for me, I'm gonna hope that's gonna be fun for everybody. And once in a while that also works too. Does that, do you, do you see that often in like, I mean, you've worked on uh, several languages and I, I suppose that the, the motivations and the goals, as you said, for different people in different languages are, you know, vary. And so maybe this is maybe like apples to oranges, but like, for example, Kotlin kind of like, I, I mean, I, I feel like when I first encountered Kotlin, like, oh, that's really cute. And like, that's nice. And it, it felt like um, an enthusiast thing at first. Like I, I just knew a few mm. devs that were just really excited about it. And I never expected that today would, it would be like my primary language and that, you know, um, and I, I think also as engineers, we tend to be kind of cynical when we see new things. It's <laughs> like, ah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But I, I think it's not, and I know we're at Kotlin Conf, so it's easy to say this, but that I, I don't think like five years ago, six years ago, we would have expected to see Kotlin in the success it, it, as it has. Is there something to you that sticks out about Kotlin or any other language maybe uh, that that makes it, I guess, successful? And I guess that depends on what their goal, the motivations and goals are. But is there something that makes something, make languages tend to stick with people? Do you see a pattern there or is there just something in common that, hey, like this is still around, people are still using it as opposed to, I was trying to think of a language that, uh, one of the like more I guess you said like maybe a joke or or for fun or like a one of those languages yeah hey it's well, like so I've talked with people about making new languages and I, I one thing I warn them is that like so I mean the, like Colin's great um, they've done a lot of things to make it great uh, but I'd also want to like sort of put the 
like ignore the efforts that other people have done to make their languages great as well. Mm -hmm. And sort of a, for lots of things, success is a combination of doing a good job and having great circumstances that make that work out. Mm -hmm. uh, and Kotlin had some great things happen for them that really helped them take off and they had great leadership to take advantage of that. Um, other languages have really developed great things, but didn't have that fortunate circumstance to sort of prop mm -hmm. them up because you need to get enough of a user base to get that momentum Absolutely. going. Yeah. Um, uh, so I warn people like you can make something awesome, mm -hmm. but just be wet ready, uh, be under understand that no, no matter how awesome it is, there just might not be a situation that cr creates enough of that infrastructure mm -hmm. for you to get it adopted mm -hmm. widely. Um, so. It's, it's always, it's always <laughs> it feels like a little bit of luck, right? Like, you know, in the infinite multiverse of, of possible languages, maybe there's a, there's a world out there where, Col heaven forbid, Kotlin wasn't accessible and some other, I don't know, Motlin, other, some <laughs> other like alternate version of it was, but it's all like luck and, and circumstance. So. I mean, not all luck, but, but there's definitely a, like, you need some luck on, it's just because of the scale of the, of the thing. Part of, uh, languages are a community problem, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's not a, individual thing right if, if we i mean occasionally some actually i do know some people who make their own language for their own little <laughs> tiny <laughs> tiny problem um but generally uh you need a community to adopt your language mm -hmm. and for someone to pick up your products it, right they need to have investment in these other people investing in it and that takes sort of that momentum to get that going mm -hmm. uh and so it's harder for languages to really just succeed out of just excellence they need some other circumstance to also to boost them up. So you need excellence and a bit of luck. I like that. And also languages are a community. I do like that a lot because it really does feel like that, especially as as a kind of feedback and like kind of relationship with both the makers of the language and the users of the language kind of like evolves and continues. So, but yeah, thank you so much, Ross. Uh, I really appreciate you taking your, uh, taking up some of your precious like practice time <laughs> to talk about programming languages. Uh, if people wanted to find you on the internet, how could they do that? Uh, the easiest thing is to Google my name. You'll get my website and then I'll have email contacts if you want to email it to me and I'll love chatting about language stuff. So Beautiful. Well, thank you so much and good luck on your talk. And yeah, definitely if you are kind of fascinated about programming languages and specifically about the one that we're talking about most at this conference, <laughs> Kotlin, uh, and especially about the type system, Ross's talk I know will be one to check out. Uh, so definitely uh, look for it when it comes up. And yeah, thanks y'all for joining us and we'll see you next one. Thanks for having Bye. me. Bye.